We're going to hear the second song later, so there will be a second song. I'm going to introduce Edgar Porter in a minute, but before we do, Edgar selected two quotes to set the tone before his talk. Kara Schwartz will read the first, and then Liesl Burns will read the second. Thank you. Kara, please. Ah, from Mark Twain. Travel is fatal to prejudice, bigotry, and narrow-mindedness. And many of our people need it sorely on these accounts. Broad, wholesome, charitable views of men and things cannot be acquired by vegetating in one little corner of the earth all one's lifetime. And from Albert Camus, don't walk in front of me, I may not follow. Don't walk behind me, I may not lead. Walk beside me, just be my friend, Albert Camus. Thank you, Liesl. Thank you, Kara. Thank you, Edgar, for making those selections. They moved me, I know that. Edgar Porter is a professor. He spent quite a lot of time teaching in Asia, China, and Japan. But I know him more as an author. He wrote these three books. I'm impressed. This one about the oral histories of the people in Japan who have suffered during the war is a talk that he gave to us last year. It was really very good and gave me the confidence to know that his next talk about his memoir will also be interesting, well presented, well researched, etc. So Edgar wrote this book, Professor Porter. This is a, a memoir. I happen to have read it, so I know you're in for a treat. And please come up and give your presentation. So thanks very much, Dror, and thank um, all of you who are here either on Zoom or personally. Um, I'm going to sp spend some time today telling some stories, um, reading a bit from the memoir, and also um, we're going to be sharing some photos um, that are going to come along with it. Uh, I believe several of you will identify with some of these stories, some of your, your own experiences perhaps. And afterwards, I hope we have some time for some Q&A. Um, just as a personal aside, I note on some of the people that are here, um, I have um, a few buddies that are here from elsewhere. I noticed one from Tennessee. I'll be talking quite a bit about Tennessee. Uh, a friend of mine is here. And then there's one actually here from Japan. I saw his name up here, too. He lives in Tokyo right now. We were together about 10 days ago, so he's also here. So. We're um, broadly uh, represented. <coughs> so a memoir for me is, had, had became something like uh, an, so an expressionist painting, impressionist painting. Something that when you look at that painting, it's um, a little blurry to the naked eye, but inside it is this incredible truth. And once I was sitting in my house and we had an such a painting in our house, and I was looking up as I was working through this memoir, and that's, I had that immediate thought. I said, that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to draw this painting, but with words rather than a brush. Um, I want to uh, mention first the publisher of this book. The publisher is St. Andrews University Press, which is in North Carolina. It's a small press, and as with many small presses, it struggles to survive economically, but also uh, it gives a venue for writers who may not uh, elsewhere be appreciated. So they, were pu they published uh, my memoir, and 100% of the royalties return uh, to the press. They don't return to the author. 
uh, and I want to encourage everyone to support your local or national or international small presses. <clears throat> so we'll go with the photos. Um, again, this is the um, cover of the book. And then um, next, please. <clears throat> From Calvin to Mal. So John Calvin, uh, here obviously on the left, um, John Calvin, rather dour looking fellow, um, was a French theologian exiled to Geneva during the Reformation. Um, he held to the view his contribution to Christian theology was predestination. Predestination basically is the belief that God has predestined everything. He's predestined especially those who will go to heaven and those who will go to hell. It doesn't matter what your contribution is during your lifetime, it's already decided. And that's the theology that I was brought up in. It's quite a confusing theology for someone going to Sunday school and hearing this poor, inexperienced Sunday school teacher try to explain that to a bunch of kids. <clears throat> and it continued to be frustrating and um, sort of um, debilitating in a way as I got older. If you listen closely, you'll find that um, Calvin believed that almost everyone was going to hell. There were very few that were going to go to heaven, uh, which reminds me of another Mark Twain quote, something like, uh, <clears throat> go to heaven, I forget what it was for, go to heaven for something, but go to hell to meet interesting people. <clears throat> so that, it, I don't think uh, Calvin would have agreed with Twain on that. The Presbyterian Church, in which I, I grew up, um, made its way to the colonies in 1640 by way of Scotland. There were the Puritans who had already begun to come here, and they were also Calvinist, but it was a slightly different, different avenues, but they both came out of a Calvinist view, so I came out, out of the Presbyterian view or the Presbyterian reality. It eventually landed in my hometown of Columbia, Tennessee, a typical small town of about 25 or so thousand, about 25,000 people at the time when I was living there. So not very far from Nashville, a little bit south of Nashville. Prior to the Civil War, the Presbyterian Church split into two as happened with other churches, but it split into two. There was, and the split came, it will come as no surprise to you, over the issue of slavery. So the Southern Church split from the National Church, established its own domain, uh, and it was called the Southern Presbyterian Church when I grew up. And it was, <clears throat> again, um, I grew up on what would be the pro-slavery side. It, they united again later, but it's after I had gotten into adulthood that the two united again. But that, that was the, um, the culture that I grew up. This is, a, um, this is a picture of the church where I grew up. This is First Presbyterian Church, Columbia, Tennessee. Not a particularly beautiful piece of architecture. It's right downtown. It's just uh, about a block and a half from the courthouse in Columbia, Tennessee. Um, my hometown, much like the rest of the South, has a long history of lynchings. Um, I mentioned this is a block and a half or so from the courthouse. There was actually, in 1924, a lynching inside that courthouse, just a block and a half from where I went to church. My youth was dominated by apartheid, Jim Crow, with separate water fountains for and they were named for white water fountain and colored water fountain in the local Woolworths, where we would do our, some of our shopping, um, and in other shops. There were separate seating in the town's movie theater when I was growing up. Downstairs white folk, upstairs black folk. Separate um, youth baseball leagues. Uh, separate, of course, segregated churches at that time. So this was where I this was the culture in which I grew up. I was born in 1949, just putting some context to that. Um, it was a time of segregated schools. It was a time of um, 
the resurgence of the KKK coming out again, as it has throughout the ages. Um, and it was a time of my growing confusion and curiosity about what was all around me and trying to figure out what would come next for me. This is a slide taken, uh, this picture actually taken just about a year or two ago. The, um, the sons of the Confederacy, the sons of the Confederate veterans has its national headquarters in my hometown. And just about a year and a half or so ago, um, this picture was taken during an internment for Nathan Bedford Forrest, infamous general in the Confederate Army, uh, who was also the founding, one of the founding members, and I'm pretty sure I'm right about this, the founding head of the, of the Klan, which was formed in Pulaski, Tennessee, just 30 miles or so from where I was raised. So they, the people, the good people of Memphis had the body of Nathan Bedford Forrest and didn't want it. And so these gentlemen who like to dress up and romance the Confederacy decided they would take it and bury it there in my hometown. I'm going to share a couple of stories um, from, the, um, from the memoir. The first story is when I was 14 years old, um, my father asked me if I would like to uh, work at our family friend's swimming pool. We had, two we had two swimming pools in my hometown. None of them were public. These were privately owned swimming pools. And so I said, sure, yeah, let's, let's do that. I'll work the summer. So I went to work at the swimming pool with um, Mr. Rainey, who was a family friend. He had been an usher in my parents' wedding went to our church, so I knew him very well. And so I went to work during the summer. I wasn't a lifeguard because I couldn't swim very well, but I worked the first, I, I worked the front gate collecting money. I worked in the bathhouse. But the memory I'm going to share is that in the evenings when we worked, those of us who were, who were there that day would follow Mr. Rainey around in the evening because it wasn't just a swimming pool. It was also a picnic park around around the pool. So we would follow him picking up all the leftovers from the picnics from that day, putting them in the back of the truck and disposing them in the trash. Well, one night um, he said he wanted to have a meeting with us back in the um, bathhouse. So we all went back. And we sat there and he informed us, again this was the mid-1960s, we're here now, mid-1960s, he informed us that he knew that the Civil Rights Bill was being debated up in Washington. And he said that for all of us to know that if that bill passed and the government told him he had to integrate this facility, that he would take a bulldozer and he would shove the bathhouse into the swimming pool and lock it up and leave. Well, the bill passed a bit later. And um, I don't know if he actually got the bulldozer out, but I know he shut down the swimming pool and walked away from it. Um, and that, that event, that discussion was, made quite an impression on me. One of the little pieces in my youth that I've reflected on for years. I'm gonna read a section now from the um, memoir. If we can go to the next uh, slide. <coughs> this, um, <clears throat> this is uh, Mrs. Annie Lou Kennedy. Annie Lou was the family maid. She was my grandmother's maid. She was my aunt's maid. She was my mother's maid. She, walked, she worked. She did the cooking. She did a lot of the cooking, the cleaning. And I never knew life without, without her. Uh, interestingly enough, I also never knew she had a last name until I was older because no one ever called her Mrs. Kennedy. It was always Annie Lou. That's all any of us ever called her. <clears throat> she was the granddaughter of slaves. She was the granddaughter of slaves from a farm owned by the Kennedys. As if you know the history of how names came about for slaves, it came a lot of times from the owners. The Kennedys were also, the, the current generation of Kennedys when I was used were very good friends with my parents. And so Annie Lou Kennedy would be working for us and maybe Mr. and Mrs. Kennedy 
of our generation will be coming in. And they both knew that history, but they never talked about it, that I heard. So I'm going to read um, a story that took place, again, in my youth. I was a little bit older at this point. I think I was around 16 when this happened. <coughs> It was summer, and each summer my parents, brother, sister, cousins, grandparents, aunts and uncles journeyed for our annual family vacation at my uncle's cottage at Perdido Bay, just inside, Atlanta, just inside Alabama, close to the Gulf of Mexico. This, the summer of 1965, also included Annie Lou. Annie Lou went not for vacation, but to cook and clean. Just outside the cottage, which held several be bedrooms, a living room, dining room, kitchen, two baths, wraparound porch where all the kids would sleep. She lived in a very small, almost a hut, little wooden building right outside where we were staying that had been constructed in the early 20th century when it was originally, born, um, originally built as the servants' quarter. So she was still, in 1965, staying in the servants' quarter while we were inside. <clears throat> I wondered about that at the time, her being outside in this small, not very nice place. But I let it slide and didn't make an issue of it. But something didn't seem quite right. The next two weeks, Annie Lou, did all the things she did back home. Mostly she cooked and cleaned, and then in the evening she socialized with some of the other black maids and yard men who worked in the other cottages up and down the beach. She went fishing with other maids in the afternoon, but she never went with my family. After the two weeks passed, we packed up and headed out for an eight-hour drive back north to Tennessee. It was during this drive that another nail was hammered into my racist core. As lunchtime approached, hunger set in. We pulled off the main road and went into Evergreen, Alabama to find a restaurant. As we pulled into the parking lot of a small, typical southern diner, I noticed Anna Lou, who was sitting next to me, look around somewhat nervously. We all knew Alabama for what it was, and even I knew that this place had probably never had a black customer in its history though almost certainly the cooks in the back were black. Of course, this is after the Civil Rights Bill is passed. It had been one year since Johnson had signed the Civil Rights Bill, and legally, Anna Lou had every right to join us in our table inside. What to do? What to do? My parents looked at each other, trying to decide how to deal with this. Finally, my mom looked at Anna Lou and asked what she wanted to do. Anna Lou said she wanted to eat. My dad left the car and talked with the manager inside. And when he returned, he told Anna Lou that they would prefer she not eat inside, but she could go to the back door and eat in the kitchen. Anna Lou looked cold now, not nervous, and told my dad she would not do that. Could he bring her something to eat in the car then, dad asked. She stared some more and said, OK. My family went in to eat in the air-conditioned restaurant, and Anna Lou ate her lunch in the hot back seat of our car. I said nothing and went in with the family where it was cool. But I looked out at Anna Lou, wondering, what's going on here? Should I do something? Should I say something? I told my parents, you know, this doesn't seem quite right. And they said, well, it's just too soon. I never talked about this with Anna Lou during all those years in Columbia. Not until 1999, well into my middle age, did I bring it up with her when I asked her once while visiting in her home if she remembered that day. Oh, yes, she said quickly. I remember that day very well. So this is Anna Lou. She passed away some years ago. This is actually her church picture. I like this. She was a member of the Church of Christ. Uh, not the United Church of Christ in the South. The Church of Christ is very different. 
um, very conservative, but she, she was in the, the, one of the black congregations, and this was, the church, this was her photograph in, in, taken by her church. And then, after this experience with, uh, with Anna Lou, a couple of years comes later, and I'm about to graduate from high school. And it, during my senior year, during the spring of my senior year, there was going to be, I read in the newspaper, a symposium up at Vanderbilt University in Nashville. And it was quite extraordinary. Who were going to be the speakers? The speakers were going to be Dr. King and Stokely Carmichael. Now here this young white boy sitting back there and comfortably in Columbia, Tennessee, was just intrigued that there was this opportunity to go up there. And I'm pretty sure I was the only uh, student, at least the only white student. By then we had integrated the senior year that went up there. And I went up, drove my car up, my parents' car up, stayed with my grandparents. My grandparents who asked me why I'm, what it is I'm going to go see, and I said, well, uh, there's a, Vanderbilt's having this educational forum. And um, one of the, said, who's going to be there? And I said, well, uh, uh, Martin Luther King's going to be there. And they went, Martin Luther King? I said, yeah, Dr. Martin Luther King's going to be there. And then I quickly added, and this was true, and Strom Thurmond's going to be there too. And Allen Ginsberg's going to be there too, though she had no idea who Allen Ginsberg was. <clears throat> and then she said, well, that's okay. You'll learn something from Strom Thurmond, I'm sure. So this photograph is taken the, on the first day of the symposium. Dr. King and Stokely Carmichael are meeting on the floor of the symposium. It's in the, it's in the, the big gymnasium there at Vanderbilt. <clears throat> and it was, a, it was a tense time between Dr. King and the Black Power Movement that Stokely Carmichael was speaking on behalf of. And I, if you look really carefully, I'm in the 30th row right above Dr. King's head. And I remember exactly this moment when they met down on the floor. And it was like, oh my gosh, you know, remember this, Porter. I mean, this is history being made. And um, so there was, there was that. Dr. King was, of course, extraordinarily eloquent. This is when he was starting to tie together the Vietnam War with the Civil Rights Movement. So he was causing lots of pain and angst among the liberal friends who were supporting him, um, who thought that was a mistake, strategically if not in other ways. Um, but he made his speech and I was just blown away. I mean, it was just absolutely mesmerizing to hear him speak in person. Um, and then the next day, Stokely Carmichael spoke and uh, his speech was very, very different. For one thing, one of the things I remember, he was really funny. Um, I mean, he very sarcastic, you know, in his humor, but really also equally eloquent, but in a very different dynamic. And those two um, made quite an impression on me, made a huge impression on me. And I was just about to go off to college when, um, when this happened. So it was quite a springboard for me. <clears throat> so graduation comes, and I was so eager to get out of Columbia, Tennessee, that I went during the summer um, to go and try to get some math out of the way um, during that summer. But I left and went, went there in the summer. As we know, the 60s and 70s were exhilarating times for um, all of us who, were, who lived through that period. Um, so many new ideas swirling around. And despite it being a Southern Presbyterian Church college, it was a liberal arts college, that when I arrived there was dynamic. It was this transition period in our nation's history and Southern history. And I was going to discover critical thinking, dominated the pedagogy of this, um, of this small liberal arts college, and it stuck. I was still religious, but changed in some ways, transitioning in some ways. Wasn't sure how, but in some ways. Curious, looking for new answers. I was always still hoping to find a Christian response to these issues that I was now learning more about and wanting to be part of helping in the change. Um, so the, of course, the racism, the warmongering that uh, was all around. I was, was looking for something. Uh, I found some in the writings of Catholic priest uh, Dan and Philip Berrigan. 
in the Episcopal priest William Sloan Coffin, uh, in liberation theology, black liberation theology, where we, which we studied in our classes, um, and some of the progressive uh, theologians and philosophers and political scientists at, at my school. So these new understandings of a Christian faith were encouraging for me, but it still wasn't enough. It still wasn't meeting, wasn't answering the questions, the fundamental questions that I had. I looked further for answers. Then some of my classmates and I were introduced by one of our young professors who had just come down from Duke University to Marx and Engels, Lenin, Trotsky, Che, and Mao, especially for me, Mao. Mao Zedong. My professor recommended I read Edgar Snow's book, Red Star Over China, which I read over, um, I think it was Christmas holidays. I took it home and read it back home. Um, and like the impact of Dr. King and Stokely Carmichael, this book had a profound effect on me to see a different view of what a communist movement can be than I had heard my whole life growing up. So it shifted me further away from my upbringing, and I dug deeper, attending the moratorium march in Washington, um, participating in guerrilla theater on campus, disrupting classes, um, and disrupting military recruiters. If we can have the next slide up, please. Like here. If you actually, you can see me in this one. <coughs> Back behind the military recruiter who's sitting in having his uh, lunch. Um, I think I'm three or so over to the left in glasses. So we had organized, uh, we had organized when we knew the military recruiter was going to come on campus, uh, uh, how, to, how to make our point. And so we did it by sort of circling where he was sitting upstairs from this dining hall. Um, and people were going in. He was trying to recruit. We also read the names uh, of American soldiers who had died in Vietnam up to that point, that whole day. <clears throat> so we followed him downstairs. And we circled him downstairs. And um, this is a photo from that, from that time. It was also during this time that uh, the FBI got interested. We all suspected, because it w was the time, that the FBI might be watching some of us in a tiny little liberal arts college in North Carolina, Presbyterian College, you know, who cares? They cared. So uh, I'm going to read a little bit. Uh, years later, I and some of my other friends from college, we, we got our FBI files. And uh, it was intriguing to, re to read them. So here's, here's one from when I was in college. <coughs> On January 7th, 1971, redacted, which means informant, advised that Edgar Adwell Porter is a member of the St. Andrews Presbyterian College chapter of SDS. Note, I never joined SDS, but was affiliated with an organization called the Southern Student Organizing Committee, which was a fraternal organization to SDS. Basically, it was decided that SDS wouldn't come heavy into the South at that time, but SOC was formed for a bunch of us in the South to, to be active uh, in, the, in the movement. Porter is a white male. They got that right. Born April 15th, 1949. Got that right. Having black hair and blue eyes. Wrong. Uh, brown hair and brown eyes. Always have. Wears black rim glasses as a, as a senior at St. Andrews College. <coughs> It then goes on to give my home address, which was correct, the exact address where I came from, and where I graduated from high school, the exact name of my high school. Um, it said I was 5'9". Um, uh, I'm 5'7 if I stand up on my toes. Uh, and they got that wrong. Um, so they got some of it right, and they got some of it wrong. The pieces they got right clearly showed that there was someone in the administration who was providing this, administra providing this information because this is in your, in your student records, your address, your full name, where you graduated from high school. But then somebody was either 
confusing me with someone else or they didn't look closely uh, at who they were doing. The, the information furnished here with concerns an individual who is believed to be covered by the agreement between the FBI and Secret Service concerning presidential protection and to fall within the category or categories checked. Here's what was checked because of background is potentially dangerous or has been identified as member or participant in communist movement or has been under active investigation as a member of such group. Yours very truly, J. Edgar Hoover, Director. <clears throat> After graduation, I spent a few years trying to find a clear path. I attended theological seminary for one semester, telling my friends who, especially my new budding Marxist colleagues, who said, what, you're going to seminary still? And I said, you know, I'm going to quote, give God one more chance. Well, God failed his exam, and I abandoned Calvin and the church. I taught school for a while in Virginia and Tennessee, engaged in nonprofit work in Appalachia, uh, fighting the death penalty and prison conditions throughout the South. Through the U.S.-China People's Friendship Association, I took my first trip to China, three-week trip, in spring, March of 1976, followed again by the FBI because later I got, the, I got the, when I got my files, there was a file about all of us who went to China on this particular trip, <clears throat> where we had our orientation. If any of you are familiar with Highlander Center, which is in, it, that's where we did our orientation. And it was with Guy and Candy Carowan, if any of you know Guy and Candy. So Guy and Candy were the leaders of our tours. So I stayed in touch with Guy and Candy many years afterwards, and we spent wonderful times together. But it was at Highlander. And so they, they were there. This is a photo of, uh, of me and uh, some of the others on our trip. Uh, and, you know, again, wondering, wonder who that informant was. Not sure to this day. Have some guesses, but I'm really not sure. So I returned and got close to an organization which was pretty new called the October League. Um, and this was in Louisville at this time, Louisville, Kentucky. So I got involved with the October, October League, and um, <clears throat> even um, later that year, when Chairman Mao died, uh, next slide please, um, <clears throat> I spoke at, at a memorial service uh, for, Chair, for Chairman Mao. I was like the most recent person who had come back from China at that time, and so I told stories about what I heard about Mao Zedong from people when I was there. This is the newspaper from the October League at the, at the time. Um, <coughs> I'm going to read another, um, it's a pretty short section to sort of sum up that trip for me. The impressions gained over those three weeks strengthened my conviction that China's Communist Party was leading the way in developing a more just and fair society. Everyone had a job and a salary, a dwelling at practically no cost, free education from kindergarten through university, and basically free medical care. No one we had met had much, of, had much in the way of uh, modern conveniences, but all seemed to have enough. I was sold on socialism, sold on China, and certainly sold on the Chinese Communist Party. Forty years later, in hindsight, I know that 1976 was a year of turmoil and that the Cultural Revolution we saw and heard of every day was not quite the glorious success it appeared on the surface. Nevertheless, the vibrancy in the cities and countryside, in the classrooms and the streets, was infectious. <clears throat> a couple of years later, I led a tour to China for the Friendship Association. And upon return, was even more committed to uh, a Marxist future. Uh, I reconnected with old friends who had now gone full bore into revolutionary activity. 
and we're moving from Louisville to Atlanta. Um, the October League had morphed into a party, they called it a party, Communist Party Marxist-Leninist, CPML, and this was where I landed. <coughs> I moved to Atlanta to give full time to the party. I didn't join right off the bat because I had decided, and in talking with uh, the party representative there, that if I was going to join the party, it was going to be a lifetime commitment. This is not something you just casually do. And so I was going to be there. We were going to, I was going to be active. I was going to be under the discipline of the party. But I wouldn't join until it was absolutely, we were all sure this was a lifetime commitment. I sold the call, the newspaper you saw a few minutes ago, at Factory Gates. I got a job at Ma Bell. It was still Ma Bell at that time. It was right before... Um, the monopoly was busted open, and I was working for, for Mobile. Joined the Communication Workers of America and represented the party <coughs> at a lot of United Front meetings, um, helped organize marches and rallies, uh, forums on racism and the war, and capitalist exploitation of workers. Um, I was stimulated by this work. I really enjoyed this work. And I liked and respected most of my comrades at that time. Uh, I believed in the cause and was expecting to eventually make this my life work. But, big but, over the months after I moved there, some doubts started to creep in. Among other concerns, I saw that democratic centralism Lenin's contribution to the organization, discipline, and protection of Marxism led to hubris and arrogance from the small party central committee headquartered in Chicago. Far away from those of us on the ground who were struggling every day just to sell a few copies of the call and sometimes getting beat up or at least threatened. <clears throat> um, they were dealing more with um, theoretical constructs, ideological constructs, that they were like, I felt, imposing down on us without understanding the realities that we were all dealing with. Heavy on centralism, not so much on democracy. And party discipline dictated no questioning. There are examples in the memoir to see. So in late 1978, through the Friendship Association, I learned that China was going to invite, for the first time, a small group of Americans to come teach English. At that time, there were a few smattering expats, some of whom had joined the revolution in the 30s, 40s, uh, and had moved into China. Um, there were a few Canadians uh, that were of our generation, but very, very few, if almost no Americans. So they were going to invite us, uh, invite some to join. And if you were interested, you just write up write a letter and explain your uh, background and why you wanted to teach in China. And so some friends of mine in Atlanta said, why don't you do that? You've been there two times. Maybe they'll choose you. <coughs> I said, no, they would never choose me. But, oh, yeah, sure. Nothing to lose. Spent a, an hour crafting a, a letter about one page long. So I sent it um, as, in a, as a little bit of an aside. One of the things I said that actually got me that position was that I'll go anywhere the government sends me in China, irrespective of location. And so a friend of mine, actually my roommate at the time, he wrote a letter also. He was much better qualified than I was. He wrote a letter and he said, I'll go anywhere you send me as long as it's Beijing, Wuhan, Guangzhou. <coughs> Or, or Nanjing. <coughs> he did not get invited. So I think that's why I got invited, and the fact that I've been there a couple of times. So I was off to China. Uh, when I arrived, of course, China was a very different place than we know it today. It was very poor, and I was sent to Henan province, which is one of the poorest, historically one of the poorest provinces in, in all of China, uh, and, and to a rather small city by Chinese standards, a rather small city. Um, it was two years after Mao Zedong and Zhou Enlai had died. 
Um, I was incredibly lucky to be there during this historical period because it was that early stage of transition from what had been to what might be and no one knew what might be. And I was there to be able to witness this and to talk, talk to people. There were only uh, three of us in our whole province that were invited. Uh, two of us were in my city, it was called Xinxiang, and one went to the capital city of Henan, uh, to Zhengzhou. Um, so I was just really very fortunate, and it was life-changing. This is a photograph of uh, the young fellow lecturing. You'll notice some of the stuff in the background, the, the slogans up on the wall that were in all the classrooms. Um, also, I was lecturing that day on Plato <laughs> and Socrates, uh, which I really enjoyed doing, and they seemed to, to really enjoy, or at least they were nice enough to say they did. Um, so anyway, the three of us were in the province of 80 million people. We were the only three American uh, young teachers, or we were the only three foreigners, actually, um, pretty much in that whole province for that time. I was warmly welcomed. I had fantastic students. I had great colleagues for two years. My party leaders were, for the most part, quite supportive and helpful. They knew my interest in politics. They knew my interest in Marxism. And so they created, for me, a political study group in English, where my colleagues from the English department would come with me. And we would do what was happening in other rooms with other departments, which political study was required at that time. So I had that. I would listen. We would talk about issues that, were ris that arose from People's Daily. That was a very common way to start it. What did the People's Daily say today? And how do we, how do we respond to that? Um, or basically, how do we follow that? Um, and there were even some discussions about what's happening now in China. Uh, I remember one particular discussion after the, from the countryside, peasants could for the first time in 10 years come and sell some goods from their fields on the streets. And they would set up these little free markets, they called them, for the first time. And there was some concern among my, my colleagues. Are we moving away from socialism now? Or are we moving towards private enterprise? What's happening? So again, it was the most uh, exciting time to be there. As a, aside from teaching and talking politics, um, if we could go to the next slide, please. <coughs> we did other things. I went out with my colleagues to help harvest for the peasants. This was a holdover from Cultural Revolution days, and even before that, where intellectuals would go into the countryside to learn from the peasants, to work side by side with the peasants. Um, so we went out and uh, did some threshing of wheat and, uh, for a couple of days, just the weekend. I just got a taste of it. But that was, um, it was actually a, a really memorable and wonderful opportunity. And then the next one, next slide. <coughs> this, is, um, this is the fun story, okay. One day, they stopped all classes and had athletic events, a whole day of athletic events. They had a nice athletic field. And so I was approached by some of my uh, colleagues and said, come join us in the 40-yard in the or 40-meter 40 uh, relay race. You'll be one of the four on the relay race. Well, that was really quite an honor, actually, and I could still run at that time. So I said, sure, let's do that. So we went out and we practiced. So we had the race. One of the interesting things, you can't see much here, there's about five or 6,000 people from the city who came to see this foreigner, if he can actually run. <laughs> and the other part of this is to see what I'm actually wearing. So I have on a white shirt, I have white shorts, I have white socks, I have white shoes, which I thought was quite appropriate. And then afterwards, some of my colleagues would come up to me and they'd say, oh, Porter Lauscher, which means teacher Porter. Porter Lauscher, we're so sorry. I said, sorry? I said, you know, we, someone must have died in your family. <laughs> and we, I went, well, no, I haven't been informed. And they went, well, you're wearing all white. You know, that's, that's the morning dress in, in 
in China, you wear all white if you're going to go out there. So it was a big lesson to learn that I might be able to quote a bit of Chairman Mao. I may, I may have read several of his works. Uh, <clears throat> I knew the history of the Chinese Communist Party, but I didn't know squat about Chinese culture. And it was a turning point for me. If you're going to understand the Chinese politics, you've got to understand the culture. And so that was a, something I moved to, to do better. It was, after the first year especially, a time that I, like in Atlanta, I started to have a few concerns. I began to see some of the restrictions uh, in a Marxist-Leninist Communist Party run um, government and, and country. And um, so I'm going to read some um, comments about that when that started to come into my mind and started to make things a little more complicated. It was about this time that I began to understand <clears throat> that to get by with as few problems as possible, it was best to say little or nothing and to support the party line no matter what it was. For most people, this was nothing new and not a real problem. In fact, the party line during these days was supported enthusiastically by most of my colleagues just after the Cultural Revolution, for their lives were improving and their intellectual contributions appreciated for the first time in a decade. So they were really enthusiastic. They, the party line was in line with what they wanted to do. Now they just wanted to be left alone, do their teaching, um, and engage in a profession that they loved. But my American tendency to question authority never vanished. I sought out quiet, informal discussions on party policies, but for the most part, people followed the twists and turns of new directions seamlessly. With a few party members that I trusted and respected, however, I asked them to clarify for me policies and actions I did not understand. That almost always went well, though the answers, while honest and thoughtful, made me question bit by bit, bit by bit, my unqualified enthusiasm for the Chinese Communist Party. I knew not everyone supported everything the party said or did, but at a certain point, they were uncomfortable voicing that. They had been through too many changes, too many disruptions in party policy over the past three decades to think otherwise. Through these discussions, I learned of the abuse professors at my university had endured during the Cultural Revolution. Suicides by some of their fellow professors still haunted my new colleagues, with one in particular who had thrown himself down a well to commit suicide. Just before I arrived, the family of that professor was hosted by the university at a, at a memorial service in his honor, complete with the acknowledgement that he had never been an enemy of the people. While I lived in Xinjiang, a special office was open to evaluate the records of all the people who had been labeled. In China, they had the term, probably still have it, but it's not used so much, to they put a hat on someone. If you put a hat on someone, it's like these pointed hats. You may have seen some of the photographs. They had a hat put on them, which means they were labeled as you know, anti-revolutionary or counter-revolutionary or some other humiliating term. <clears throat> and it was with the intent to resurrect their reputations. I was told that in every case, those educators were exonerated, late as it had, may have been for many. I also heard stories at that time about the famine that decimated much of the countryside in the late 1950s. My province, Henan province, was the epicenter of the famine. I found out later. There are now books and articles about that period, and it, Henan province was the epicenter of the famine. <clears throat> Professors recalled having little to eat and being told by the party to rest most of the day. Don't teach, don't exert any energy, just conserve your, your health as well as you can because there wasn't much to eat. There was a river that flowed by the university and some of them went and tried to catch fish or crawfish or whatever they could find there to eat. <clears throat> it 
These were not stories I'd heard before coming to China. They had been sidelined in the information that I had been receiving. We heard glimpses of there had been a famine, but the famine was blamed on the Soviet Union because it called in its chips and they had to send all the pigs to the Soviet Union to pay off their debt so there was no food left, that, th these kind of stories, but it was much more than that. It's much more than that. So this caused a rethink um, and made me um, begin to wonder what, uh, what was going to happen to China and how was I going to respond to, to this. This was quite a lesson to learn while trying to hold on to the romance of the revolution that had brought me to China in the first place. Some went to China, like me, idealistic about China's socialist advances. And some of them, unlike me, turned bitter when they discovered the story was much more complex and in turns darker than they had expected. I, while shedding my idealism and strict adherence to Marxist ideology, <coughs> I never turned bitter. I respected the great achievements brought about by the revolution, but tempered that respect with a reality check on the authoritarian nature of the party and some of its horrible mistakes, some of which they began to acknowledge um, later. I'm still a friend and I'm a son-in-law of China and see no reason to turn away from friends and family there and will do whatever I can to help facilitate relations between the two countries during this difficult time. I married my wife, Ran Ying. We just celebrated our 43rd wedding anniversary, the beginning of this, uh, the beginning of last month. Um, we married toward the final months of my time in China. If you want to know more about that story, and it's a pretty good story, you're going to need to read it in the, in the memoir. We left China bound for Hawaii in early February 1981. And this is a photo of us at the airport. It's Ran Ying and me with her parents who went to see us off at the Beijing airport on our way to Hawaii. Her parents had been for years uh, in the foreign service for China in the very early 1950s. They joined with the, the new government, with the party, and wound up in, in Europe as, uh, as a, not ambassador level, but as diplomats. And so I was very, very fortunate because they both spoke really good English, and it facilitated very good relations I had with them. So the one part I will share about my wife and I, is that after we moved to Hawaii in July, July 31st, 1981, we uh, became the proud parents of triplet boys. Now, remember in China they had a one-child policy. So we were in there and we had three, so <coughs> we became the heroes to, their, to our friends back in China who could only have one child but may have wanted more because we could, have, <laughs> we could have the three. So there's more moving from Marxism to international education, which was a career that I embarked upon. I was 20 years at the University of Hawaii, 10 years at a Japanese university, and I spent a year in, a, in Salzburg in Austria at a university doing international education. <coughs> if we can go to the next few slides, please. So this is me. Uh, somewhere along the way, I went back to uh, Vanderbilt University, where I heard Dr. King and I heard Dr. Carmichael, and got my doctorate. And uh, I'm there with a colleague of mine, and we're about to enter the auditorium where our international students are graduating. Uh, and the next one, please. These are with some of my students um, in the room. I'm wearing a um, I'm wearing a shirt that's actually the flag of Vietnam. One of my students from Vietnam gave me that flag. It was Vietnam Day on our campus. So we were back there. Um, they were my TAs, these, these young people right here. And we were helping, starting to plan the next day's classes. And I think there's one more. Let's see. Yeah. And this is, I made, a, I made several returns to China in my international education life. And this was one where I spoke in Beijing. Uh, at the Beijing Forum 
which was hosted by uh, Beijing University. Um, presentation I made there, and it was very gratifying to be able to go back and, and be welcomed back. Even though my politics had changed a bit, no one seemed to care. And I was still contributing to China in other ways, helping work out exchange programs, helping bring some of my former colleagues from China to the U.S. Uh, to do some research, so that was all, that was all very good. <coughs> Finally, I had an eventual return to the South, moved back to Tennessee, um, and now I'm here in Brooklyn. So it's been quite a ride. I'm going to read finally one very short passage that's in the conclusion of the memoir. <clears throat> I'm content to say that this journey through John Calvin, Mao Zedong, and the myriad of diverse populations that I have met over the past seven decades has been worth the trip. When it's all said and done, I've learned there's no sense in following too closely any dogmatic theologian or prophet or any Marxist theoretician or cult figure. For each lead to a shuttered door that blocks our natural instinct to explore and stay curious. We are left simply with the challenges, the opportunity to lift those up who need lifting, teach those who desire to learn, and visit those who need visiting, utilizing whatever talents and skills we have to bring that about. It matters little if the motivation flows from a church, a synagogue, a mosque, or a temple, or from socialist, Marxist, green, liberal, or even conservative affiliations, as long as the effort leads to a more kind, more just society, a more loving, left, less self-centered, and giving community, that would be enough. So thanks very much. There's a couple of other. <clears throat> this, is, this is a picture of the family. Yeah, so that's the, tr that's, that's the three boys, and, and two of them have their own sons. So two grandsons and Ron Ying and I with them. Uh, this was taken in Hawaii uh, not too long ago. And the last picture, I think, a photo, that's my two grandsons. So the book, uh, the memoir is dedicated to Bo and Eddie. This was a fishing trip we took in Tennessee a couple of years ago. Okay, and then one more, I think, <coughs> the cover, and then the next one. Just to let you know if you're interested in getting the book, uh, it's available at, um, yeah, a Troubled Sleep a bookstore, a wonderful um, bookstore, down on 6th between Park Place and, and uh, I'm sorry? Sterling. Sterling, around Sterling and Flatbush. It's down, it's down towards that end. Um, so they have, um, last I saw they had at least one copy, and they're going to have some more. They're, they've been ordered, but they haven't come in yet. They'll probably come in Tuesday or Wednesday. Um, and then the other is on Amazon. And... I'm glad to say, for those of you who read ebooks, the Kindle edition came out last week. So it's on Kindle and it's on paper uh, if you're interested. Okay? Do we have time for questions? Thank you very much. <laughs>